born in rural Haskukuri some 63 years ago. He has gone on to become a well acclaimed physician, immunologist, public health advocate, academic, and university administrator. He has a medical degree from the University of Natal and a string of specialist qualifications obtained from many leading international institutions, including Oxford University. He's not shy of controversy, having survived racial attacks and false sex accusations even. And he has not kept quiet when he felt many South Africans were dying needlessly due to AIDS denialism. And after struggling for four years and with his recent semi-retirement, we have finally managed to lay him into the studio this morning. Good morning and a very warm welcome to Bonita's house call here on SABC2 Africa. I'm Dr. Victor Ramatesil. Let's watch. My virtue of the authority vested in me, I constitute this congregation of the University of KwaZulu Natal. Those who subscribe to the great man fear of history would attribute the university's success to its leader, and the more socialistic would attribute it to all concerned. And maybe the truth is to be found somewhere in between the two. What is certain, however, is that the role and impact of Malikapuru William Makhoba's leadership on the institution's trajectory has not been insignificant. Professor Malikapuru William Makhoba was born in 1952 in Sekukune, South Africa. He is an immunologist, physician, public health advocate, a pioneer in higher education transformation, academic and vice-chancellor and principal of the University of KwaZulu-Natal. An internationally recognized molecular immunologist, Mahova's research has made seminal contributions to identifying and understanding the cell surface molecules and genes important in the human immune system's response. A global leader in HIV vaccine research, he has served in the leadership of the South African AIDS Vaccine Initiative as the founding chair of the UNAIDS WHO African AIDS Vaccine Program and as a founding member of the global HIV vaccine enterprise. There we go. Prof, good morning. Good morning. I have an 11 letter surname that many people mispronounce ever so much. Almost gotten used to it. I want us to clear, is it Makhoba ma or Makhoba or Makhoba? It's Makhoba. Makhoba. Yeah. In relation to Makhoba's Kloof, the area in Limpopo? Well, that's where my great-grandfather ruled. Okay. And uh, the, the, the name Makhoba's Kloof is derived from the kingdom of King Makhoba, so who was my great-grandfather. So you are royalty? Well, if I didn't have anything to do with my life, I could go and fight with my, my cousin <laughs> to become, <laughs> you know, in retirement to become a chief. Thankfully, uh, but, but not that's, that that's, not, that's not the point. I'm part of the clan, and I'm a respected member of that clan. I give advice when I can, but I don't think I want to be a chief or a prince. But yes, you can say so. Now, tell us about your origins. Uh, particularly how that influenced your choice of medicine as a career? Well, you know, um, I, I was born in Skukuni, in a, in a small village called Skunot, which is the Sk place... Sk Sk Skunot. Skunot. Yeah. Skunot. Uh, Skunot. Yeah, Skunot. It's a German yes. uh, Skunot. Yes. This is actually the first place in Skukuni land where the missionary settled and established a church and a school. So the first school in Skukuni land was in Skunot. I see. And my great-grandmother was a sort of a maid of the famous Marenske, who was a Lutheran missionary. That's where I was born. Now, my father came from Akhobasluf. He met my, f my mother, uh, and uh, the story goes, my father liked a gramophone and when he came to Skukunland, he bought a gramophone and he used to play and all the girls would come and dance <laughs> and he was a great dancer. <laughs> That's how he met my mom. Okay. <laughs> That's how he met my mom. Mm. And I still know that even today, I think my mother always, her eyes twinkle when she sees my father, you know, do some little bit of dancing. Mm. So this is, this is how they met. Okay. So they met in 19, I think 1950 
I was born in 1952, and when I was 11 years old, uh, my father was fell into diabetic coma. It was in June. He was unconscious, heavy breathing, and we didn't know what was his problem. Uh, we had to take him to Jane Fest Hospital, and he was di diagnosed as insulin-dependent diabetic. And when he came out of hospital, I was, I'm his eldest child, so I was the child who used to test his urine using something called Benedict solution. And it will, you know, if the sugar was high, it would be brick red, it would become yellow, it would become, it would give you all the colors. And that's where, that was my first lessons in chemistry. Mm -hmm. But also it was where I derived the passion that maybe, uh, you know, I should go into medicine and uh, maybe I can find a solution for my father's illness. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's how really my passion for medicine grew, but also my passion for chemistry and molecular issues in, in medicine. And that's meta science. Yeah, meta science. That's, that's, where, that's, that's where it came from, yeah. It was 1963. I remember the date was the 11th of June and we were having a wedding at home. And you can imagine being the eldest child, I had to see my father being carried out of a wedding to go to hospital in coma. It was both traumatic, but uh, you know, he had told me that if he should pass away, I should take the responsibility of the family. He and had told me that when he was still conscious. And thankfully, he's still alive today and he's 94 years old. Yeah, he's 94. He's injects himself with insulin at seven o'clock every morning to the tilt. He's 94, he has never been in hospital. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant stuff. Talk about every dark cloud having a silver lining. Now, as our discussion gets a little bit hotter, come with me. Let us now hear more about some of his academic achievements. Let's watch. In addition to being a recipient of the Caring Physicians in the World Award by the World Medical Association, he has received numerous awards and honours, including fellowships at both the Royal College of Physicians of London and Imperial College Faculty of Medicine. He is a founding member of the Academy of Science of South Africa and a foreign associate member of the Institute of Medicine of the U.S. Academies of Science. Professor Mahoba is a member of the National Planning Commission and was Special Advisor to Minister of Science and Technology. Professor Mahoba is currently Vice President of the International Council for Science, ICSU, Chairperson of the Health Science Review Committee and Chairperson of the Transformation Oversight Committee of Public Universities. Professor Mahoba was honored by President Jacob Zuma with the Order of Mapungubwe Silver for his dedication and excellent contribution to the field of science and medicine. Professor Mahoba has been awarded the MRC President's Award for Exceptional Contributions to Medical Research. The award was made in recognition of his exceptional contributions to medical research and is among the highest honors bestowed by the MRC. In this country, they don't come bigger than the order of Mapungube, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Take us quickly now. So you then moved to Huiti, was it? Where did you do a matric? Yeah, you know, uh, when I was doing Standard 6, I don't know what it is now in the new nomenclature, uh, I was the top student in the district of Leidenberg in Skokuni. Mm -hmm. And then, and because unsurprisingly, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, okay. I, I was uh, the top student, mm -hmm. and rumors began to spread that no, it's because I was in my father's school, he would have opened the papers for me. I see. And my father said, "You know what? I don't want to have this nonsense. I think you must go far away from here, okay. and prove yourself." Okay. And uh, so that's how I ended up at Fiti. And then when I arrived there, uh, within. I think we, I arrived there in January. At the end of February, they wanted me to go into Form 2, okay. from Form 1. Because you're just too hot for Form 1. Well, <laughs> I, I, I was just getting everything, Got it. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's almost. So that one of the teachers uh, was called Mrs. Huare. Mm -hmm. I think she was the president of uh, BP, uh, what is it, uh, Black People's Convention. Okay, BPC. Yeah, yeah, yeah she was that. Mm -hmm. And she was very political, highly political. In fact, she is the person who trained Peter Mugaba. I see. So we were sort of that okay. group of youngsters that were being politicized by her. Okay. And, uh, and she requested that I get moved into Form 2. And then she came to me and said, don't you think you're wasting your time here in Form 1? I said, it may be, but it will n it, how would it look if I was the only child who left Form 1 into Form 2? Mm. Why don't you guys set a standard 
so that people can compete for. I see. Uh, and those that get that standard go to form two. Okay. But more Quite unselfish also. But, right? but uh, mm. more importantly, I said, they must speak to my dad. Mm. Because when I was doing standard four in primary, my primary principal wanted me to write standard six. I see. And my father said, no, he's too young. He will leave his friends, and it will be unfair. Mm. So at Huiti, they set up a, sta a standard of if any student got 80% in June, they must move to form two. So about eight of us, I think, were promoted that year, uh, some of who became my best friends. And some of them, you know them, they became doctors. Mm. Dr. Neluheni, mm. the late Dr. Mudiba, mm. and, and, uh, and a few other people. It's quite a brandy branch about those, those guys, okay? W well, we mm. were just good buddies. I see. Really, yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, so, so you went to Huiti, and then from Huiti you went to then, the then University, University of, of Natal, yeah. uh, uh, UNB section, yeah, or yeah, yeah. the black section. The black section. And then, and then you passed, or you obtained your MBCHB in 1976? In 1976. Yeah. And then how do you land up outside the country? Uh, when, I was, uh, when I got my result in 1976, uh, there was the professor of medicine, was Professor E.B. Adams. And when all of us were excited about our results, he called me into his office mm. and said, you know, you are the first uh, student in the university, uh, the first African student to get uh, a distinction or merit certificate in, in, in medicine. Mm. And it would be a sad thing for you to go into general practice uh, because you've got some little bit of talent. Mm. Uh, that's how he put it. So I, uh, he said to me, don't go and, and go into practice, come back and do postgraduate studies. Immediately, after uh, Immediately, yeah. and, uh, and he said, if you do that, I promise you I will uh, do everything to make sure that your career is safe. Mm. So I went, uh, I went to McCoy's Hospital to do my internship, and then the following day, he gave me a senior medical officer's position in his department, but then he was retiring. I see. I went to him and said, look, it seems like this plan is not gonna work. Mm. You are going away to retirement. I don't know who's coming. What is to become of me? He says, no, don't worry. Uh, I will find you a scholarship to go to Oxford. And that's how, that's how you that's, ended up. That's how I got the Nafel Dominion Scholarship to go to Oxford. It was because of Professor Barry Adams. Oh, bless his soul. Is he still alive? Uh, no. Uh, uh, and, uh? Is he still alive? I, I guess not. No, no, he okay. died maybe about, uh, maybe about six okay. years ago. But hang on now. Before I go to the advert, can I take you back to 1985? You are now a lecturer of internal medicine at the University of Natal. Yeah. You have a bunch of African students in whom you have taken an interest. Yeah. And you are talking to them, advising them on their future careers. Yeah. Yeah, some of them you are even predicting where they are going to end up. You remember that meeting? Yes, I there remember. There was Dr. Komati, who is today a physician. Yeah. There's the lady, Dr. Matiba, who Chibi died. Matiba, who she was, was a, a cardiologist. cardiologist. There was Professor uh, Maposhani Chabedem, who is yeah. in, in microbiology. Yeah. And there was a student whom you said, I think you're going to end up somewhere in media. Do you that's remember you, that? That's you. <laughs> uh, because, I, because, uh, because I didn't, uh, I didn't think that, uh, I, I, I could tell that medicine was not difficult for you, okay. but it was not your passion. Mm. Uh, but you could use your medical background to promote medicine like you're doing now. Correct. Uh, rather than spend your life carrying stethoscopes and fiddling around with people's breasts and, uh, and you know, and pulses and bumps and so forth. And how right you were, 30 so years later yeah, here. Yeah. So I, I thought that that was your passion. Uh, and I didn't know I would be right. Uh, the other person was Tsubongseni uh, Jomo. Correct. And, uh, and Bongani Mayosi. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a bit junior to all of you. Mm. But you know, when I came from, from overseas in 1985, I had this passion that, you know, there is a lot of talent amongst African students that is often not recognized and it just dis dissipates into nothing. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, the six or five of you were prepared, I think, to come and listen to my rebels uh, on Saturdays and Sunday. And uh, all of you have become somebodies in the country today. And how grateful we are. And I I'm I so I happy I that I your I predictions I were right. Yeah, I'm actually. <laughs> 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 no, we're going to continue our discussion with Professor Malakafur Makhova as I look at the, some of the highlights in his career and maybe some controversies that he has created over the years. Hang on, Stay with us.
on the 1st of January 2004, the University of KwaZulu Natal was born. A new institution with a new mandate to address historical imbalances, especially those relating to race and gender in the realm of science and innovation. It also had to ensure access to students from disadvantaged communities. It had to devise new forms of teaching and learning so as to accommodate the university community in a more relevant and appropriate way with a view to addressing national priorities. These immense tasks fell to Professor Mahoba, the first Vice-Chancellor of UKZN. But transforming an institution did not come without its problems. Structures had to be changed, many old ideas and conventional ways of thinking had to be jettisoned, and in the process, some had to lose their privileges. This meant that there would always be opponents to restructuring, reconfiguring, and re-evaluating. But how did Professor Mahoba achieve this? Not without controversy, Professor Mahoba's leadership has been widely cheered and equally jeered, but the test of leadership is to be found in both legacy and longevity. After 10 years in office, the Vice-Chancellor has left behind a financially stable, academically viable, and politically acceptable institution that speaks to current exigencies and future challenges. In 2004, the founding Vice-Chancellor, Professor Malekhapuru Mahoba, was to be supported by a 17-member interim executive management team carefully structured to address the immediate needs of the merger. <laughs> Prof, what influenced your decision to move from academic medicine to administration, as it were? Uh, I didn't move into administration. I moved into leadership. Okay. Uh, and there's a big difference between those two things. Uh, I have never been the best administrator but I understand the concepts of leadership much better. Right. So, so basically, leadership entails three things that I've spent my life doing. To have a clear vision where you wanna go, to be courageous because whatever, wherever you wanna go, other people don't want you to go there, mm -hmm. and to have integrity as a person. That means your words and action must match each other. You can't say this and do that, and you have integrity. It's, it's just the two things, the two things don't work. Now, administration is really just about the processes of functioning and operation. And any, anybody can do that. Tom, Dick, and Harry can do that. And I'll give you, I'll give you a, an example, because I used to be a doctor. When, when, when I was a medical doctor practicing, the thing that fascinated me most was the idea of making a diagnosis. Once I had made the diagnosis, I knew that I could get anybody to treat a patient. Okay. But the challenge was to make the best probable diagnosis about what you are seeing. And that to me was my, my fascination in medicine. Okay. Struggle hard to make the right diagnosis and let Tom, Dick, and Harry give the medicine. <laughs> <laughs> That's very fascinating. I, I, mm. I, had no, I had no interest once I knew that my diagnosis mm. was right. So you're not going to be a surgeon. We can forget about that. Well, mm. no. Mm. I, you know, I decided when I was in CDA that I would never be a surgeon. Mm. And that decision was made very simply. Uh, once I went into theater, and the theater was stinking because there was a perianal abscess, mm. and somebody had opened it. Mm. And I said, how can I be educated and want to spend my life <laughs> in stinking places? <laughs> so I could never be a surgeon. Oh, never. boy. Talk about the horses for courses <laughs> now. Quickly now, quickly. So you leave at the insistence of the late Professor E.B. Adam. Uh, the advice. Uh, and advice. Know, he, he, didn't okay. have, he didn't insist, no. So, so, so you didn't he, 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 he wanted to secure my future. He wanted to secure your future. You had an agreement, a yeah. gentleman's yeah. agreement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and, and, and to which he remained I, I, I respect that for him, yeah. I've right. always known that. So you go to Oxford yeah. and you study immunology uh -huh. uh, and you practice there for a while. What influenced you to come back to South Africa after having a fairly successful life in the United Kingdom? Uh, there were a few things. Uh, first of all, you know, I'm, I'm a traditional baby 
person. Okay. I'm the eldest child of my parents. And there are certain responsibilities as the eldest child that you can't delegate to anybody. And my parents were aging, and, uh, and obviously they needed me to be here, and, uh, and really that was very, very important. But there was also a second element. You know, we had all stayed outside the country because our country was not safe, and it didn't, people had run away, talent had gone away, and now here was an opportunity that our country was getting free, and, uh, and I just felt that it was opportune for me to come and be part of those people that can contribute. Because some people had contributed their life for my country to get free. I thought I could contribute something that relates to my brain that I'd learned from overseas that uh, you know, I, I could uh, come and inspire young people, assist them, shape their future, but contribute to the country. The third element was uh, the late uh, Madiba. He came to England and I came to South Africa and he said to me, you must come back. I want you here, uh, I want you to contribute to what happens in the country. And oh. that really was a big statement because I think he was in um, uh, Shell House, I don't know what it was called before, but uh, he sat with me in his office and said, I want you to be back here so that you can make a meaningful contribution. And uh, you know, I've read your work and so forth. And people never realized, when, when I was uh, uh, overseas, I worked for a former South African called Sir Raymond Hoffenberg. Mm -hmm. He was the president of the Royal College of Physicians. And whenever people in the movement had problems, medical problems, uh, he was often consulted. In the liberation movement. Yeah, he was consulted by uh, people like O.R. Tambo. He was very close to those people. And when my diva was uh, at Victor first there and suffering from TB and yes. so forth, he was one of those people that uh, was privy. Mm -hmm. And I was his right-hand man. I see. So, you know, in a little way, I was often asked, go and read, go and come and talk to me. So it's those little things that kept me connected to home, and I felt I should come back here. So when do you decide to leave clinical medicine and go into leadership, as you call it? Um, you know, um, clinical medicine for me ended in 19... I left uh, South Africa in 1979. Uh, I did my PhD, and then I went back into clinical medicine to get my registration as a consultant. And during that time when I was doing my senior registrar, I realized that uh, in medicine, problems come to you. In science, you create problems. I see. And you solve them differently from in medicine. You know, when you've got heart failure, it is at a particular stage, I have no control over it. Mm -hmm. But in a laboratory, I can create heart failure I see. and choose how I study the heart. I can't study the heart when you have heart failure. No, no, no. There's so, no so time to play there. Yeah, yeah that's, mm. that's the first. So I decided that I was interested in, you know, how to create problems in science and try and solve them, but also to define small basic rules that are general in science that can assist. But to be honest, you know, people with heart failure, they come to you with the same complaint. Now, in science, you don't have the same problem because you can change the parameters quite easily. In medicine, these things, so you get easily bored. Okay. All heart failures, they all come, you know, we have got a problem of breathing, and my heart has got palpitations and so on. So now you I didn't I find didn't it challenging I, I didn't find it, it's okay. not so much it's not challenging, it's not exciting. I see. Yeah. Not exciting. When you come back, we now take you to Fitz University and many other places. When you return, we'll continue our <laughs> discussion with Professor Malakha Purumakhova. You stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching Bonita's House Corner here on SABC2. And today we're having a one-on-one -on -one with Professor Malikha Puru Makhob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prof, no, we, we, when we left, we were talking about how you moved from clinical medicine to science and the fact that in medicine you confronted with the same problem every day and maybe slightly different methods of solving it. Whereas in science, you have the, you have the ability yeah. and we have the latitude of to changing define, the to parameters define the problem and coming up. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, but you did that. Now, how do you land at Vets University? You know, uh, Vets had been trying to get hold of me since 1984. Okay. Uh, I think they made three attempts for me to come back and be part of them. And it wasn't until 1993, uh, in the middle of the year, that I received a formal invitation from the then Vice Chancellor, uh, Robert Charlton, uh, whether I could consider the position of a Deputy Vice Chancellor. And of course, uh, I said no, I, I would have to come to VITS to come and see what the situation was like. Indeed, I came to VETS, and uh, the University Senior Appointments Committee had arranged for me to see the stakeholders of the university. Uh, Michao, uh, academic staff unions, Senate people, and, and a whole range of people. Then I had an interview, and uh, it seemed to go well. I was staying at a Devonshire hotel. Oh, Devonshire? Yeah. Downtown. Devonshire. <laughs> In Bramfontein. Yeah. yeah, I can see. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the night... Before I, I was to leave, five people knocked at my door. Okay. It was Wu Sintlapo who became the president of Nehau. He was Nehau at Wits. I remember the one that used to wear a cap. Yeah. yeah. And yes, Dan Mutaung, who was the, stop sh uh, the shop steward at Wits. Mm -hmm. And then there was uh, three young students, Peniel Mashile, who's late, Makuku uh, Mampur, who's now in the provincial government here, there were, yeah, there was uh, um, David Makura was part of them, but he didn't come that evening. I see. The premier. The current premier. Yeah, party. and then there was another guy called uh, Sifiso, Sibusiso uh, mm. uh, mm. uh, from, uh, from Stenga. Mm. So they said to me, we come to see you because we hear that you've been here and, uh, and you haven't met us. And I said, but who the hell are you? Mm. The university had organized for me to meet the right people that I needed to meet. <laughs> they said, no, mm. you didn't meet us. Mm. We are from Sasko, mm. and it's from Nihau. Oh, I didn't see Sasko and Nihau. It was true, I hadn't seen them. Mm. So I asked them, why do you think the university didn't want me to meet you? Mm. They said, well, it's because the elephant in the room at Vets is transformation. And, uh, and these people didn't want you to meet us because we are the people who are championing transformation at the university, okay. and they are trying to find, they are trying to find black people mm. that are like coconuts. Okay. You know, the ones that uh, want to assimilate into white culture, mm. and maybe they saw that you are in England, mm. and maybe you, have, you are one of these anglicized. Who, who the I don't know, I'm an mm. anglicized mm. African. I see. And in fact, it was true because at Wits, uh, I'm told the white staff were saying, we are looking for a black Charlton, mm. Professor Charlton. Mm. And they thought that they had found one in me. Okay. And uh, I mean, I didn't know that. So this, this kids told me the big issue here is transformation. And what we want is for you, I said, you know, this looks like uh, something that I'm not used to. Why should I come back to come and mess my life uh, of research and so forth? They said, no, there is a bigger challenge here. Uh, of transformation, and you can you can assist us. So they said, think about it, and uh, and I said, no, I'll think about it. And really, so I came and went back, and my mandate was very clear. You come back to South Africa, you come to Vets, transformation is your number one issue, and that transformation must be informed from this perspective where we're coming from because we've been struggling. And we can't have you, and you are on the other side. Mm. This is what the students are saying. The, the students and, and, and how? And the unionists yeah, are saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're given the post. Yeah. So I, I went back, and I, on the basis of that, I could have said, no, man, this is going to be heavy stuff. Mm. Uh, and then I went back, and I assessed everything, and I thought about the old man who had said, I must come back, and I thought it was an opportunity. So I decided to come back. But I knew absolutely in my mind that the thing that I had to deal with in South Africa was the transformation of higher education. And I tell you, there were other factors that made me do that. Because I'd seen that, if I may use this funny word, standards mm. of higher education in South Africa were low. Okay. The qualification of the staff in South Africa was very low. Mm. In Pathetic fact, in your view. Eh? Pathetic in your view. Well, it was embarrassing. Mm. But, but nevertheless, people took their children to 
to the universities. Mm -hmm. You know, so so the qualification were low, the productivity uh, uh, of the system was very low, and there was this culture of uh, of disempowerment and alienation and pervasive racism that was very subtle. It was maybe brutal in Pretoria, subtle at Wits and UCT. But then, nonetheless. But, but, but nonetheless, it mm. was there. Okay. And, and I thought, maybe I could play a role here. Okay. Uh, and that's why I really came back. So for me, I often tell this to people, it was Sasko and how that persuaded me to come back and deal with transformation. You took the job yeah. at Wits, yeah. and then no sooner had you started the job than started finding serious, serious, serious uh, yeah. opposition yeah, to yeah. And finally left. Uh, yes, what happened was that uh, I took the job. 18 days after I started the job, the students took the, the registrar, not the registrar, but uh, the human resource director hostage, Mr. Dixon. Mm -hmm. And Sasko and how took that man hostage. Mm -hmm. And then when he was taken hostage, all the white senior management were afraid to talk to the students. And you know what they do? They said, well, we now have a nigger here. Mm -hmm. Go and speak to your people. Go and speak to your people. <laughs> and I told, I told they the vice chancellor. I, 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 I told yeah. the vice chancellor, no, mm. I don't know anything about what has been going on. Why mm. should I go and resolve it for you? Mm. But you know, that was the beginning of a of a very unpleasant time. Uh, at the end, I think we had what people called the Mahoba affair for six months and so forth. But the issue really was about racism, was about being anti-transformation, was also, I think, uh, you know, the white liberals trying to hide their own poor qualification and the fact that you know you went at wits you find this one was so and so's wife that was so and so's brother that mm. one there was so much uh, nepotism there was well inc incestuousness <laughs> in, scary in the, stuff okay yeah. so uh, let's move on quickly yeah. now because yeah. so, so you eventually leave wits and go back to the medical research council yeah i i took all. a job as a as a as a personal chair at, at Hominium, as they call them, mm. chair, which is one of the most prestigious professorship in a university, I is see. to have a personal chair. Mm. It's, it's much better than being a deputy vice chancellor. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if I had to. Yeah. In the same institution? Yeah, yeah. No, no, it, mm. was, uh, it was at WITS, but okay. with the Institute, the South African Institute of Medical Research. I see. Because that's where I think most of my colleagues and people that I worked with uh, were there. In fact, I already had a small laboratory there, yeah. You are also known for a comment that you made uh, uh, about South African white men, calling them baboons. Now, that, that, that is a little bit scary. Now, how, how no, I, 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 I didn't call uh, white South African males baboons. Mm -hmm. uh, you that. know, I, I read anthropology and I read many books. And there's a book uh, called, I think it's a, okay. There's a book that I read about, you know, concepts of the minds or something like that. Mm -hmm. And this book describes how various uh, animals mm -hmm. behave in particular ways. I see. That primates, mm -hmm. for example, of which human beings are. Correct. Baboons are primates. Mm -hmm. Bonobos are primates. Okay. They have a structure mm -hmm. of dominance. So there is a dominant male, it's often a male, mm. uh, in, in, in those primates. In human beings, you all know we've been co oppressing women, so we've been the dominant character. Mm. And when you are dominant, like dictators, you want to be imitated. I see. You want your followers to do exactly what you do. So I, have, uh, I, had, uh, I had read this and I said, there's an analogy here okay. of what we do. And in South Africa, the way it came about was, you know the Buremach. This was a bunch of Afrikaner males who went public that they want to drive all the Africans on the N1 towards Zimbabwe, mm. because that's where we belong. We don't belong to South Africa. Mm. So, so that's, that was the origin of this. It was this, it was this uh, philosophy of dominance, imitation, that is characteristic of primates I see. that I was seeing in South African I males. See. Oh, at least for the first time, we get to know exactly what you meant, because I must say that statement was, was taken out of context. Everybody, everybody saw that mm. I was saying that. Yeah. But you know, funny enough, one person made a comment. It was the late S.K.M. Pashela. Mm. He said, I've read many articles. In fact, he wrote me a personal letter. He says, I'd never seen an article where every word 
was in the right place and every sentence was in the right space and when you read them, they made sense. He said, I couldn't remember when I read that. Serious credit coming from a person who's a science student. We'll continue our discussion with Professor Malekha Purubakhova after the break. Welcome back. One day, so that's what I'm looking for. Sorry, that's my opponent's house called who is ABC Two E. The name of the group is Zang Naka. Katu. Can you hear the chest or cover the pretty chest? The casita na don't sana say no. No, I know I'm a cover. Who talk about the gas cooking? Go to one of our number. Shuma Gai is a pillar. President Mapai served as the first chair of council. President Tabombegi delivered the inaugural Albert Lutulu Memorial Lecture in 2005. The Chancellor, Dr. Frini Jinwala, and Professor Melechaburu Mahoba, the Vice Chancellor, were inaugurated. A special conference, commemorative publications, and cultural performances marked the historic event. Such a big day there, Prof, wasn't it? A very emotional day. Yeah. A very emotional day. Yeah. You, would you say that the 10 years that you spent or so at the University of Natal, transforming it from University of Natal Quasar to what Natal. is now known as University of Kwazulu Natal, was probably the highlight of, of your career? Or maybe one of your major achievements? Uh, you know, it depends. I think, uh, as I say, I came here with the mandate of transformation from Sasko and the How. Mm. And, and of course, I understood it in the broader context of the country that was transforming. When you look at it in that context, yes, because uh, it is an example of how leadership can work to bring meaningful change. But you know, uh, as you have uh, taken my life through various phases, Really, the highlights of my achievements were very, are scientific. I see. Okay. That's where you feel you, you, you've made the, a big the difference. Yes, yes. Well, well, I mean, I, I have published work in the late 80s that is still being cited today by my peers. It appears in textbooks. It's mm. influencing decisions on diagnosis, investigation, treatment. In immunology? Yes. 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 Now, uh, this is what, you know, because you're always known for where you end up in yeah, life, and, know, and this and is why I wanted to correct it this morning. No, no, yes. no, no. Mm. The best thing I ever did was the work I did in science uh, in 1986 and 1988, because that work was groundbreaking. I see. It has got so many ramifications for almost every pathology. Pathology had to be reinterpreted after that work. I see. And, and you can't ask for more. You know, it has been, it has been the subject of debates. Uh, I was even invited to Stockholm to, the, to a Nobel symposium mm. because that's where the best work is often selected to be looked at and be seen to be. So it's not many people who come from Skuno or Skukuni <laughs> who end up that's for sure. in, in Stockholm. That's for sure. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so so, I, I, okay. so I, I take pride in my scientific Contribution. And that's how you'd want to be remembered. Well, that's, 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 that's really the that's biggest... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's me. But hang on now. You know, the president uh, fairly recently was waxing lyrical, and I think appropriately and justifiably so, yeah. about the strides that South Africa has made yes. in dealing with HIV and AIDS in particular. Yeah. Would you say, in your own way, you contributed to that process? Uh, you know, I don't want to sound arrogant. I think lots of people know that I was, I am close to President Becky. Uh, lots of people knew that. Uh, that should be hard to believe because all we know are the public spits. Uh, well, no, I think, I, think, I think people mm. often mistake intellectual debates for emotional I things. See. I have no, uh, I don't have emotional issues about President Becky. He's a politician, I am a scientist. I see. And, uh, I, I, I and you're good friends. I, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're friends, and I respect him. Mm. I, I will always respect him. He taught me a lot. Uh, I think we worked together very well. 
But you know, science is brutal. Okay. It doesn't have friends. Can you repeat this? <laughs> a, a science is brutal. brutal. It has no friends. It's got no friends. Yeah. That and and, and when, when, when I get into that space, yeah. there are no friends. Okay. There are facts. Okay. And those facts must be based on evidence. Okay. Now, I was privileged. President Becky actually consulted me before. Mm. And I wrote a letter to him. And I wrote that letter because my diva had called me to his house and asked me, uh, Professor Mahoba, you know science. What advice did you give President Becky about AIDS? Mm. I said, Tata, uh, as you know, I will go back to Cape Town. I was president of the MRC. I'll go through my notes, and I'll send them to you, and you can see what it is. I'll bring them. When I brought them, he read my letter, and he immediately picked up the phone and wanted to speak to the president. Mm. He said, you told him this, and this is how he's acting. Mm. But that, there's a long story to it. But so the crux of it was that the president did not believe that HIV caused AIDS. That's a, and yeah. he said there is scientific evidence of that. And I, I, to, I told him, mm. frankly, that if I was wrong, I would resign from being president of the MRC. Mm. He must find the evidence so that I can be fired. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I said to him, I could not lie to the nation. I mean, people are dying. What, what would be in my interest to, to say this to you? How was the matter resolved? Well, you, as you remember, they called uh, uh, an advisory panel that tried to fudge the issue and so forth. And then they appointed Mando, who messed up things further. Uh, it wasn't until Aaron Mutswadidi was appointed that the whole thing began to turn around. Mm -hmm. And they went back to the original things that I'd written about what should be done with AIDS. Okay. <laughs> Very interesting. Now, quickly, so y y you go to the University of Natal at yeah. the time, trans trying to transform it into the University of KwaZulu yeah, Natal. Yeah. You had had a disastrous outing at Vets University. Now, were the challenges different? Uh, because you stayed much longer at Natal, and I think. The evidence that we saw today was that you did a great, great job in transforming well, that institution. Uh, no, the challenges are not different. Mm. But, uh, but uh, I think the people are different. I see. Let me when I left this, I went to the MRC. Mm. Uh, and as you know, the MRC was an Africans-based uh, institution. And you know, when Africaners make a decision that they are turning around, they turn around. Okay. They don't waste any time. Mm. There are not too many debates. Mm. And when I went there, I learned that you could have a group of South African people who are committed to change mm. that would change. So, and when I went to Natal, mm. that approach in me had grown that, you know, if you engage people, it doesn't matter how hard they are, mm. they will change. Mm. There was still a cabal at Natal that was in, in cahoot with the people at VETS ah, and the people at UCT. I see. Because these liberals, they operate like a pack of wolves. I see. They exchange notes. Uh, they tell each other what to do, they defend each other, and then they say they are transparent and they are independent. Why did you succeed at Natal at what you faced at Advance? In one sentence. Or, or in or one sentence is that I think uh, the, the place was ripe. I see. When I spoke about transformation in 1994, mm. whites thought they still had power. I see. When I spoke about the same thing, in 2004 at Natal, it's almost like 10 years after that. They, they had realized that, mm. you know, what they can do is to live with us. Mm. Hold it there. Hold it there. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, 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 You're watching Bonita's House Call here on SABC2, and welcome back. Sama, Prof, you are now in retirement, are you? Yes. Uh, we are not going to hear or see you uh, as often as we did during... No, uh, uh, retirement means that I've left the University of KwaZulu Natal. It doesn't mean my mind is dead. I see. My mind is very active, and I'll contribute to this country when I'm required to do so. And, uh, of course, I'll have to consider things carefully so that I, I don't, you know, I don't uh, exhaust myself. What message have you got for South Africans out there? Well, you know, I've lived in many parts of the world. 
I have been to through to many institutions. We have we live in a great country in the world today. I think this generation of ours, we were born in a very special time of our country, and uh, we can build it to be better. And I think the National Development Plan spells that out clearly. It's not a perfect document, but it's a roadmap that we should all read and uh, imbibe in order, I think, to change our country for the better, because we really come from a, a horrible past. And uh, there's nothing to be depressed about South Africa. It's one of the most dynamic, exciting countries that has come from the ravages of a potential war to the excitement of opportunities. I mean, I couldn't be who I am today if I was not South African. So the country has given me opportunities. I did disappear from it for a little while. I'm back. It's given me opportunities. It's for me to use those opportunities to give back to the country. And I'm trying to do that. And I think all of us can try to do that because we are all talented in different ways. Professor William Malikapur Mahov, I think uh, me and the rest of South Africans got to know you a little bit better today than what we read in the newspapers and what we get to see in the media. Thank you are now in semi-retirement, and I take this opportunity to wish you all the very best in your future endeavors. And if you want to relax a little bit, I think this is the time to sit back and look at the great work that you've done and enjoy South Africa as it improves, as you have said, the National Development Plan as it unfolds. Thank you very much for spending your time this morning. Thank and you. we hope that we will be able to tap into your wise counsel into the future. But that way, Boksuge is not a matter of the same thing. It's 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 not a matter of the same thing. We'll be back next Saturday with Parkinson's disease. So don't miss it here on SABC2 at 8.30 in the morning. I'll go back to the next one. Tato Haile Amrel. Thanks for joining us today. From me, Dr. Victor Ramuresi Ramatisele. You take care.